Hello everyone, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Today, we're taking a look at diagnostic ROMs, cartridges, and programs, and how they might be able to help us troubleshoot our vintage computers. This is topic number two in the Troubleshooting Vintage Computer series, and it's also the second video in the series that has been released. In some ways, a diagnostic ROM or cartridge has picked up the reputation of being able to tell you exactly which part you need to replace on your computer. This can sometimes leave folks down the wrong path. Today we'll take a look at these troubleshooting aids and find out their strengths and weaknesses and how we can use them. The first steps in troubleshooting were covered in topic one in this series, titled Evaluation. If you haven't watched that already, I would recommend you do that first, as we'll be building upon what we learned in that video, in this video. I'll place a link in the description down below, as well as a card up here on the top of the screen somewhere. Well, what do you say we jump right in and get started? Now you might be saying, hey Bert, what exactly is a diagnostic ROM or cartridge or program, and how can we use it to troubleshoot our old computers? That's a darn good question, and I'm glad you asked. A diagnostic ROM or cartridge or a program is a series of programmatic tests that was developed by the factory or an enthusiast to try and test various aspects of the machine for proper functionality. For example, the dead test cartridge on the Commodore 64 might flash the screen to try and indicate a fault trying to write to or read from a certain RAM chip. Now this may indeed indicate a bad RAM chip, but it could also be in the glue logic such as the multiplexer or other chips. Make sure to find and read through the documentation that comes with a diagnostic cartridge or ROM. That way you'll know what tests are performed and what they may indicate and may not indicate as being wrong. Let's first take a look at diagnostic cartridges. A lot of old computer systems could take programs in the form of cartridges and this is a convenient format for diagnostic programs because it doesn't rely on loading it off a disc or cassette or anything like that. Some computers will allow an external cartridge to bypass some or all of the system ROMs so tests can be developed that don't rely on the system ROMs being functional in order to run. Some can also make use of a loopback harness to test the control ports and I.O. ports of the machine as well. Let's take a look at the Commodore 64 dead test cartridge. This was developed by Commodore itself to aid repair technicians when servicing the Commodore 64 computers and it was later adapted to work with the Commodore 128 as well. At first it runs a series of tests on a limited area of RAM and if any of these fails it'll try to flash the screen to indicate which I see it was trying to write to and read from when it detected the failure. Of course, if the video circuitry isn't working, you're not going to see that flash. In fact, I did a repair video a couple years ago where this fact was very important. If I'd started with the dead test cartridge, I may well have been led astray. But starting with the checks that I showed in the first topic in this series, the voltage checks, clocks, and reset, and things like that, I was able to zone in on the problem relatively quickly, and it turned out to be quite a simple fix. I'll put a card up here on the screen and a link in the description down below to that video in case you're interested. If the initial RAM tests seem to pass, it'll try to turn on the screen, run some further tests, and show you the results. Commodore did write a really good manual for this. Let's have a look at a few of the sections that I highlighted. That's the SID test. One of the first things we notice right here on the first page is it says the dead test cartridge is primarily devoted to system RAM testing and it doesn't test any of the ROMs or any of the ports. And it also says it's possible to have a RAM failure that's not consistent. So it may seem to pass on the first try, but if you let it keep running, you may notice some failures and it'll keep track of those for you. Here on page two, it tells us that the diagnostic test exercises the microprocessor system RAM, and SID circuits. It's not really testing for any other IC failures. Here on page 2-1, it tells us if the initial RAM test is successful, a character set is downloaded into the lower RAM, and the diagnostic testing will continue. This lets us know that the character ROM on the system board is definitely not used. 
And here on page 2-3, it tells us that the power-up RAM test will work with only the processor, the PLA, and the VIC chip present. You don't need the SID or the ROMs, etc. As I mentioned before, these sort of tests can sure save you time and get you pointed in the right direction, but they can't always tell you accurately exactly which chip needs to be replaced. For example, if the dead test cartridge tells us it suspects a certain RAM chip is bad, we can do a quick check by taking a no good RAM chip of the same type and saddling it over the suspected bad RAM chip. There's our SID test again. Oh, the SID works. Anyhow, and if it then starts working, well, we know that we have a pretty good chance that that RAM chip is indeed bad, but most of the time we're going to have to go back and look at the schematic in the service manual and look at all the other circuitry that's involved with something like the RAM system. Let's have a quick look at that here. This is page 8 in my Commodore 64 service manual. It might be on a different page on your manual, but this just shows us the RAM section of the schematic and what all is involved. These chips right here are the actual external RAM chips, and there's eight of them. Each one of them is one bit, so there's 64K bits per chip for a total for 64K bytes. The VIC chip, that is the video chip, also talks directly to the RAM, and these two chips right here will decide whether the microprocessor, the 6510, or the VIC chip gets to talk to the RAM. And there's also an inverter chip right up here. Some more glue logic here. So the point is, there's a lot more involved in the RAM system than just the RAM chips themselves. And a lot of times when there is a problem talking to the RAM, it winds up being one of these other guys. So if you're uh, dead test cartridge indicates a RAM problem, make sure you're checking out all these other things too and looking for the address and data signals and control signals getting everywhere that they need to go. Another great test cartridge from Commodore was the diagnostic cartridge with the accompanying loopback test harness. The loopback harness connects the various I.O. ports of the Commodore 64 so it can send a signal from one place and receive it at another and thereby check out if both chips are working properly. Commodore also wrote a nice manual for this, which not only covers the diagnostic cartridge, but it also has a good troubleshooting section in the back as well. Let's have a quick peek at it. This is the diagnostic cartridge manual, and we're on page 1-2 here. And there's a note here that points out that failures, uh, particularly with things like RAM, might not be consistent. So let the test run several times, and this will actually keep track of failures, you know, even if it passes on, you know, successive tests. On page 1-3, there's a note here to remind us that the 6510 processor that's in the Commodore 64 does have some RAM built into it. So if you have a zero page or stack RAM failure, that's going to be in the processor itself, not in the external RAM chips. And our diagnostic cartridge does do a checksum of each of the three ROMs and tells us if it matches. Now, there were variations uh, in the kernel ROM, particularly from Commodore, I think three different official uh, versions. So it'll check for those three versions. Um, if you have an aftermarket kernel ROM, this is going to show as a failure, even if your ROM is good. There is a nice troubleshooting guide in section two. This can come in very handy and it's worthwhile to read through. The design for the test harness I have here is from Sven Peterson, and he took a great deal of trouble to make one that was easy for everyone to build, and he even corrected a problem that someone reported that was in the original harness that Commodore designed. He has this freely downloadable from his GitHub account, and I'll put the link below in the description. For the cartridge itself, I bought a dual diagnostic cartridge from i 64 in Canada a few years ago. I like this because it had this nice toggle switch to switch between dead test and the diagnostic test, as well as a reset button. Now, I designed this case and printed it myself based on another design on Sven's GitHub, 
And if you happen to have one of these boards as well, I put the design for this on my GitHub as well. And of course, as I said, the link is down below. Now let's take a look at a couple real life examples of failures and we'll see how the dead test cartridge and the diagnostic cartridge handle them on this Commodore 64 board here. I've had this dead test cartridge running for a while now. It's up to a count of about 15 and it's passing with flying colors. I'll go ahead and cut in one complete run of the dead test cartridge here in the video. It'll take about a minute and 45 seconds and then we'll get back to this testing. Okay, now I'll let you know what a past dead test looks like. Let's go ahead and switch this over to the diagnostics cartridge. I already have my loopback harness in place. Flip my switch down there to diagnostics. Now let's turn it back on and nothing. It's a black screen. How can that be? We just ran the dead test cartridge for a full 10 minutes and it passed with flying colors. And now when we switch it to the diagnostic cartridge, we get a black screen. What's up? Well, if we take a look at our dead test cartridge manual, remember we covered the whole part where the dead test does not make use of any of the systems realms on the Commodore 64 board, whereas the diagnostic cartridge does. It uses both the kernel ROM and the character generation ROM. It doesn't use the basic ROM though. So out of these two ROMs it uses, we might speculate that it's more likely the kernel ROM because if it was the character ROM, well, it would probably still work and would get a display, but the display would be garbage because the character generation would be wrong. Now, if the chip wasn't socketed and we didn't have a replacement, we might want to make sure before we take the time to desolder that chip and risk damaging the board some more. So we'd want to do some more tests, checking for all the control signals and the data and address lines at that ROM chip. Let's take a look at page seven of the service manual and we'll get an idea of how the ROM address decoding works. This is page seven on the version of the service manual I have. It might be on a different page on your service manual, but what this is showing us is just the section of the schematic dealing with the ROMs. You can see here we've got our basic ROM and our kernel ROM and our character ROM and that all three of these are selected directly by the PLA. So if we are under the suspicion that our kernel ROM might be bad, knowing this new information we would want to go in and uh, you know check the chip select signal here, check all the address lines and data lines to make sure those are all toggling. Uh, and looked like what we would expect. And if they did, we would have a pretty good indication that our kernel ROM was indeed bad. We could then use a logic probe or an oscilloscope to check for all those signals 
and get a better idea if we need to swap out the ROM or maybe there's a problem with some blue logic. As it happens, I do know that this kernel ROM is bad because I put it in there on purpose. I found this bad ROM in a Commodore 64 I fixed a few years ago, and I happened to be doing a video at the time, so I'll cut in a card here and I'll put a link down below so you can have a look at that video if you want to. I put a good kernel ROM in this board and fired up the diagnostic test with the loopback harness again, and you can see it's passing now. After this segment, I'll go ahead and cut in a full test video, and you can hear the SID, but you notice the SID and the control port both say bad. That's because I've got an ARM SID on this particular board, and the way the paddle input works a little different than what the diagnostic cartridge is expecting, and while the paddle input works with the ARM SID, it doesn't like the test too well, but that's okay. Now here I've got a bad PLA in, and this is kind of an obvious sign of a PLA with a bad shaking screen. And if it happens to run long enough for this test to go through, it will pop up and say it's a bad PLA. So in this case, it does catch it, but again, it could be uh, a trace leading up to the PLA. It may not be in the socket, right? That type of thing. And I've got another PLA here. It had a very interesting problem. It would work in this motherboard every time. And well, 99% of the time and run just fine and it would flake out just every once in a while. And when I put it in this board, it doesn't work at all. And if I have it in this board, it'll pass the diagnostic test every time. It's a very bizarre thing. So the point is the diagnostic tests are a really big help, but they're not perfect. And sometimes if you're not careful, it can lead you astray because I know it certainly has me a few times. A diagnostic ROM, such as this one for our Amiga 500 here, gets plugged into the system board in place of the original kernel or kickstart or firmware for your system, and it runs directly on the metal without that kernel or operating system or anything in the way. This allows it to run some really low level tests without depending on the operating system or kernel or whatever being operational. The test program on the ROM will do different things like send signals to certain chips and expect certain results and if it doesn't get that it'll indicate that to you. So that could indicate a problem with that chip actually or perhaps it's a cold solder joint or a corroded socket or something like that. The good thing is is a lot of times it'll point you in the right direction even if it can't pinpoint exactly what's bad. I have our diagnostic ROM plugged in here in place of the Amiga 500 kickstart and we'll get this turned on and have a look. Hi, this is Future Jeff. I wanted to cut in here real quick and let you know about something I forgot to mention on the Amiga diagram. It can actually send and receive serial information even when you don't have a video display. This is very handy in cases where there is some functionality on the board and you don't know exactly what's going on you can hold down some of the mouse buttons or keyboard buttons as you're booting and it'll send out information over the serial port. Look in the text files that come with the diagram for more information on this. What you'll notice as this starts up is that the screen is going to flash all sorts of strange colors and it'll display some text that's hard to read because it's pretty fast. And then it'll pop up a menu. Now, you'll notice on the capture to start with, the menu is kind of blurry. This is because I'm on an NTSC system here. 
And uh, the fellow that writes this, uh, the infamous Chucky Hurdle, has PAL machines to work with, but he does his best to make it work for us folks in NTSC land, too. So I'm going to press the space bar here and give it a second. That'll change the video display mode so it looks a little better. This Amiga diagram, as Chucky calls it, is a free download, and I'll put the link in the description below. I picked up some new old stock 27C400 uh, EPROMs from eBay and used my Mini Pro programmer and an adapter that allowed me to program these to burn this EEPROM. And I'll put a link to the adapter uh, as well. And if you have a 32-bit Amiga, you're going to have two ROMs you need to swap out. There's a high and low, but it's the same sort of arrangement. Now on the back of the Amiga here, I've got a couple loopback adapters. Let me see if I can pull one of those off. Oh, dropped it. This just goes one for the serial, one for the parallel port, and it's got some wires jumped around to various pins in here. And the directions are actually uh, kind of hard to find as to what needs to be done for this. It uses the same uh, loopback arrangement as the Amiga test kit, I believe it's called. Yeah, it's by, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, Kirf or Kirf, the Amiga test kit. Anyhow. It uses the same uh, loopback arrangement as the Amiga test kit, and it was kind of hard to find the wiring arrangement for that, but it's actually hidden in part of the Amiga test kit. Uh, I printed that out in a PDF, and I'll put that on my GitHub. Put the link down below so it's easier for you guys to find. Anyhow, I made up a couple of those loopback, one for the parallel port, one for the serial port. I've got a mouse and joystick plugged in here to test those two ports. and we can do things like an audio test and we'll play some music. Usually escape will make something stop and you press 9 to go back to the main menu. If the display gets blurry on you again, press and hold space once or twice to get back to change the video mode. Um, Something else I'll point out here is on the IRQ and CIA test. If you're on an NTSC machine, select number three. And that way it'll probably test them. Uh, if you're on a PAL machine, select number two. So our CIAs are probably good on our NTSC machine. And we can go into the port test, and I'll check the parallel port. You've got to kind of hold the key down for a little bit on this because it doesn't have everything running like would be in the normal kernel. Press the key, and it'll run, and this keeps running continuously, which is really nice. Okay, now the serial port. That works out fine too. And we can check the joystick. So you can see on port one where I've got the joystick, that works. See the changes for the mouse. And that's real nice. And one thing I appreciate because I had problems on this particular Amiga 500 with the keyboard was being able to test it like this. If we go into keyboard test, It'll show you the scan code, things like that, and the character being pressed. And I stole some of the, the keys for the number pad here to replace over on the main part of the keyboard because uh, some of the co rubber contacts were bad. So you can see one works, two works, three doesn't, period doesn't, the zero down here doesn't, this enter doesn't. Well, it kind of does sometimes. And you can also test the disk drive to some extent. Uh, you can draw some nice graphics. I've noticed it does lock up on NTSC machines sometimes, but you can use the regular control Amiga Amiga to reset it. Particularly in the graphics modes, it seems to like changing back to the PAL types graphics, which doesn't work. There we go. 
and you can see it went back to kind of that blurry screen. I've got to go back to the main menu and press the space bar a couple times to get to change the uh, video mode. So even with the quirks this program has, I'm really grateful to, to Checky for writing it. It makes working on these systems a lot easier. If you've downloaded this and you find it helpful and you use it a lot, you might want to think about uh, sending Checky a few dollars on PayPal to thank him for all his hard work. Now that we've talked about diagnostic cartridges and ROMs, let's move on to diagnostic software. Now, why am I separating diagnostic software? Well, it generally requires most of the computer to be working in order to run. And it runs on top of the operating system or kernel on the computer. For example, you might have a diagnostic program to test the keyboard or extended memory or a disk drive, that type of thing. So how do you get this diagnostic software onto your computer? One really convenient way is something like an Easy Flash. You can create your own cartridge compilations and save them into one cartridge slot on here. And this makes it very convenient and very quick to switch in between different test programs. It's also very good for a 1541 type test program. I also use an SD card a lot with an SD to IEC for testing things like a RAM expansion unit. Since this also plugs into the cartridge slot, you can't have the Easy Flash in there at the same time, of course. Let's go ahead and plug in the Easy Flash and we'll take a look at some of the diagnostic programs. All the programs I'm going to show from the Easy Flash and from the SD card are on my GitHub and the link is below. We've got the Easy Flash running and I've got a video capture going with that, so I'll cut it in here too. I put this under the D slot for diagnostics. And one thing I did when I got this computer out is I noticed that the U key wasn't working quite right. So I took the keyboard apart and cleaned it. And I'd like to test that now to make sure all the keys work. So if I go into 64 Doctor, the first test in this program just happens to be the keyboard test. Press return to select that test, B to begin the test. You can see it changes the highlighting and underlining. So the U key seems to work fine now, which is good. And if I want to run another test, it's as easy as hitting the reset on the Easy Flash. I'm going to go back into Diagnostics, and I might decide to run SidBench. This computer does have the arm sit in it, remember. And I recently updated it to, I think, 2.9 firmware. It's the next to the latest one. Well, go ahead and reset that. And I also like how the Easy Flash leaves you right back in the directory where you were before. There is also a uh, screen of oh, yeah, that I'm. If I could talk, there's also a few screen test type programs, which just draw color bars and, and things like that. The last one I want to show you here is the 1541 Disk Diagnostics. Now this is from World of Janney, and he took a bunch of different utility programs that were available and combined them so they would all fit in one 8K cartridge slot. And there's things like alignment check, show the BAM, so you can um, send disk commands, show the directory, a speed check, things like that. The one thing I wanted to bring to your attention is if you look at his website, he makes special mention about the alignment function here and what its limitations are. Now, if you have a factory produced disk, like an original one from Commodore or another major manufacturer, those would have been produced on commercial disk copying machines. So the uh, chances are that the alignment is very, very good on them. You can't use a disk that you made yourself or somebody else made on a Commodore drive to check alignment. That's not going to work too well. Okay, now I've got the Easy Flash cartridge out of there and I put in my 1750 RAM expansion and we'll be running a RAM test off the SD to IEC device. So first we will load the file browser. And if we go to my Commodore 64 directory, 
You'll notice on here how some of the characters are turning blue as I scroll. That is a problem with the kernel ROM in here. It's version 2. That's a bug it has. So someday I'll swap that out for a version 3 kernel. And I separated these. You can see the asterisks in there just uh, by section or type of test. And on this particular program, the memtest mem program, it's very particular about how you load and run it. And to get around that, I made up a little uh, simple basic chain loader type program, which is, oops, I went past, which is mtest load. And that just loads in mtest and then does the right system call to run it. Uh, the memory test program was designed to run on different Commodore platforms uh, and automatically detect what it's on and run itself accordingly. So hence the interesting loader requirements. So now it's going through and it's going to test the RAM that's in the CPU itself. Uh, then it'll test the RAM that's on the system board and then it'll locate any RAM expansion you have, either a Commodore RU or a GeoRAM or something like that. It'll try to find it, discover what it is, and run the appropriate test. And of course, this is a perfect use for the SD to IEC because, like I said before, you can't have the Easy Flash plugged in at the same time. You can see it also discovered that it was running on an NTSC machine. It tells us what the clock speed is, what the size of the REU is, that type of thing. And we passed all the tests. You see, we can go back in and run another test program. Now, some test programs aren't going to let you exit that clean lane. If you have an external reset button, it makes it a lot easier so you don't have to power cycle it all the time. Of course, the test programs that I'm using from the SD to IEC, that uh, D64 file is also on my GitHub, which is linked down below. Our Amiga 500 has her clothes back on, and she didn't want to be left out of the diagnostic software party. And I've got the same dongles that I used for the diagnostic ROM. These also work for the Amiga test kit here. And this will allow you to do things like uh, test the memory, test the keyboard. And the nice thing about this, you don't have to take the machine apart to swap the ROM, but you can't test all the things you can with the diagnostic ROM. We can still do the mouse test. Uh, this parallel and serial test with the loopbacks. That still works. And of course, right here is where they hid the, the Dongle Build Guide. So if we look at the description here, there it is. That's how you build it. And of course, it'll test the CIAs too. And it has a bit of a video test in here as well. So all in all, this is a really nice program. There's one more I'll show you. It's the test card program uh, that I used when I was first setting up this Amiga 500 about a year ago in a video, I guess. So we'll reboot this guy. Okay, here's our test card program. And this is an NTSC machine, so we'll choose NTSC. And this displays some nice test screen, so you can check out to make sure your video output circuitry is working fine. There we go, you press space to get into the And it's got some patterns here that you can use for adjusting CRTs as well, which is kind of nice. There are other sorts of diagnostic aids too. A few weeks ago, Adrian from Adrian's Digital Basement Channel did an interesting video. He replaced the ROM in a Commodore disk drive with a circuit that always returned a no-op instruction. The link is in the description below. So here we can see the circuit he came up with, and he used resistors here to keep from shorting out or loading down any particular data lines. And, well, why would he do this? 
it goes back to if you were building a small computer circuit from scratch, one of the first things you might do is wire up a no-op instruction. A no-op means no operation and the microprocessor just does nothing and moves on to the next uh, address in memory. So if you had a permanent no-op instruction wired, your address lines are just going to continually increment from zero all the way through and then roll over back to zero. And your data lines are also going to be in a known state. So if you have an uh, addressing problem, this allows you to check every address line with uh, a known set of conditions to see if there's a problem. I thought this was a really clever idea. Later on, Frank from the IZ8DWF channel uh, expanded upon this idea and provided some more general guidelines for using this type of no-op generation circuit in a variety of different computers. I would highly recommend both of these videos to everyone as well as both channels and the links are down below. I hope this video has helped demonstrate some of the benefits and some of the limitations of using a diagnostic cartridge or ROM or piece of software. They sure are nice additions to your toolbox, but they do have their limitations. While they can get you pointed in the right direction, they can't tell you accurately exactly which part is bad. If you take the results of the diagnostic program that you're using and you combine that with information from the schematic, from the service manual, and even the directions from the diagnostic program, it can get you pointed in the right direction and save a lot of time. In future episodes in this series, we'll take a look at using specific diagnostic tests to help locate specific faults such as RAM, I.O., address decoding, and things like that. There are diagnostic programs and ROMs and cartridges for just about every system out there. So take a look at the forums and ask around and see what folks find helpful for the system that you're working on. In the description below, I've included links to diagnostic programs that I use and some that I'm aware of. I've also put a tentative list of topics for this troubleshooting series below in the description. So take a look at that. And if you have any ideas or questions, please let me know. Say, if you're a subscriber, thank you. I really appreciate it. It helps out a lot, and it helps other folks find the channel, too. If you're not a subscriber, what the heck are you waiting on? And if you look down below, you'll see a rectangular subscribe button. If you click on that, dude, it'll subscribe you to this channel. And then you'll notice a bell-shaped icon. And if you click on him, YouTube will be nice enough to let you know just as soon as I post a new video. If you find these videos helpful and you'd like to help support the Haybert channel, just look in the description below for the links to our Subscribestar and Patreon accounts. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my Patreons and folks who have donated equipment to the channel. Your help is really appreciated and I couldn't do it without you. Stay tuned for the next video in this troubleshooting series. If you have any questions or comments, just let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, bye.